continuation of the one from last week, all of it taken from Matthew chapter 13. At the end of the discourse of various parables about the kingdom of God, St. Matthew caps it off with the saying that we just heard, all these things Jesus spoke to the crowds in parables, and without parables he did not speak to them. This then should cause us to ask what is meant by this and why our Lord did this. In commenting on the passage, St. Augustine offers the most likely interpretation that Matthew is not saying Jesus only taught the crowd using parables, but rather that whenever he taught publicly, he always threw in at least one parable. For instance, in the Sermon on the Mount, when he was speaking to the crowds, our Lord says many straightforward things without using parables, like love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. But in the discourse as a whole, in the Sermon on the Mount, he uses many short parables, like the one about the man who builds on rock, as opposed to the man who builds on sand. So it was not that our Lord only used parables when speaking to the crowds, as if he had a secret doctrine that only some would know, but rather that he never thought would not taught without using a parable at some point in his teaching. Why did our Lord use parables? There are many reasons why, I just want to touch on three. First of all, he is the creator of the world, and so he, above all others, knows how the material and spiritual worlds relate to one another, and how material things are signs of spiritual realities. He is the God of both nature and grace, and since we are more aware of nature and things around us, he used those things to draw us to an understanding of grace. The second reason is that parables have universal appeal. Anyone can have some sense of what it is said, even a child. If I waxed eloquently this morning about the philosophy of Pseudo-Dionysius, I would hopefully get the attention of some of you, very few I imagine, but most of you would go away unfed. But if I used an image that Dionysius used, even if you knew nothing about him or his thought, you could still benefit from the image. Our Lord was a good teacher, in fact, he is the teacher, and he knew that parables would work more effectively than just passing on abstract notions or even moral formulas. That is also why our Lord used parables that are common to human experience, or at least should be, like baking bread this morning, or growing plants, military service, and weddings. He did not wish his teachings to be esoteric or exclusive, but it also means that in our technological age, we should still do human things like bake bread and have a garden, serve the country and celebrate married love. In this sense, it seems that the ideal Christian would have sheep, a vineyard, and raised crops. He would have served in the military and also be savvy in business, fish in his free time, and regularly, often attend wedding banquets. So each of you should get started on whatever is lacking in your lives. <laughs> But seriously, if we do work at any of these things and learn them for ourselves firsthand, we become more receptive to the kingdom of God and also more open to divine wisdom. A third point is that parables are open to varying depths of understanding. In the Confessions, our Holy Father St. Augustine speaks of Scripture as a nest for chicks who cannot yet fly and need great care and safety. But scripture is also an orchard for the advanced. He says they fly about in joy, breaking into song as they gaze at the fruit and feed upon it. The Lord's parables are just like this. To those in the nest, they are good, solid doctrine. They teach a simple truth which advances salvation. But to those flying around in the orchard who are more advanced, the parable is an inexhaustible source of contemplation and spiritual insight. For instance, in the parable of the sower, it is very straightforward. He teaches us to avoid the things that destroy our faith, like fear and pleasure and riches. But it also offers so much more, such that every time we read it, if we are attentive, we can enter more deeply into the mystery. St. Jerome says that the Lord mixes things that are plain with things that are obscure that by those things which we understand, we may be excited to get knowledge of the things that we do not understand and read more carefully. 
A good example of all this is the parable of the mustard seed, which our Lord gave us today. We all, or most of us, have the experience of planting seeds or nuts and seeing that something so small can be some, become something so substantial. I have seen mustard seeds, use them in cooking, but even though I have never planted one, I can ask someone who has, or find a picture of one, to gain more understanding of what our Lord is saying exactly. The more that I know about mustard seeds and trees, the more that I can understand. But also the more time I spend with a parable, and the more that I grow in holiness, the more I understand it also. But the basic truth remains ever evident to everyone who hears the parable. The kingdom of God seems small, but if you wait on it patiently, it grows far beyond your expectations. One image that we could use in connection with the mustard seed is that of the Eucharist. The host is small, and it surely seems ridiculous to unbelievers that we receive it so devoutly. Yet we know that under the appearance of bread is found divine life and divine power. We receive it from our Lord and plant it in the field of our hearts. And we trust that it will grow into eternal life, which is the tree. And though we receive the Lord many times, even every day if we wish, it is not as if we are planting new seeds in our heart, it is the same seed, maturing there until it grows into a place where we can live, which is heaven. And since the Eucharist is not only divine life and power, but our Lord himself, we can see how the sacrament can be both a seed and a tree at the same time. St. Gregory the Great says that Christ is both of those things, a grain of seed when he died, and a tree when he rose again. He is a seed in us as we grow towards maturity, but in due time he will be a tree in which we, his birds, can rest. By his presence in us through communion, he teaches us how to die as he did, so that we can live in him eternally. And not only that, but he truly chose to become a seed, something so small and meaningless in the great scheme of things, to take on our humanity so that he could be our tree in which we live forever. So as we receive that blessed mustard seed in Holy Communion, think on these things. No matter how small the kingdom seems or how much the condition seems to be poor for its growth right now, the divine seed is powerful and it cannot be destroyed. The Jews once tried to destroy it and they failed. It became a tree that filled the entire earth. And the same can hold true for now. If the whole world is trying to destroy this divine mustard seed, the Son of God and the Son of Mary, then what does that mean for the growth of the kingdom, except that the birds will roost in the tree in larger numbers than we can even imagine? And so we should not fear, but take courage and fly. And fly, and not resting, until we reach the branches of eternity. And then we will know what the words of Isaiah mean when they come to fulfillment within us. Have you not known, or have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases his strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. 